So I have the pleasure of introducing myself. I'm Judy Gasson, <laughs> and I'm here to, uh, to talk about uh, why I believe that cancer centers matter. I've been a cancer center director at UCLA for 19 years, and I've been here on the faculty for almost 32, and it's been a great pleasure to have several careers here at UCLA. And so this is a talk that I originally prepared as the keynote talk at the Stanford Cancer Center's retreat. And, you know, we try to get mileage out of everything we do, so I've been recycling it for a variety of audiences. So Joe Simone here was the chair of my external advisory board for many, many years. And he wrote an article in the Journal of Clinical Oncology about understanding cancer centers a number of years ago. And he described becoming a cancer center director as an activity that will compromise your personal academic activities and the directorship of a modern academic cancer center is difficult, stressful, and consuming job. This is the best part with limited sources of satisfaction. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be a cancer center director? So what I'm going to talk about today is to define the goals of the cancer center, the mechanisms that are available to achieve those goals, and one approach to creating a translational pipeline here at UCLA. So when you're evaluating the success of your cancer center, there are a number of milestones and criteria that you can use. And a lot of these are things that we have to report to the National Cancer Institute every year. And so they're the usual types of things like, how many high quality publications have we published? How many dollars in grant funding have we obtained? How many patients have we enrolled in clinical studies? And I think these are all very important, and they can be counted, and we have to report them back part of the Cancer Center Support Grant to the National Cancer Institute. But in my years as being a Cancer Center Director, I've come to believe that, in fact, these are not the most important things by which to measure our success. What we really want to look at is the impact that our Cancer Center is having. Are we fundamentally changing the way cancer is prevented, detected, treated, and the quality of life in survivors? There are very few individuals who are able to do this by themselves. But the goal of a cancer center is to achieve this. The cancer center has a broad spectrum from basic science, clinical, translational, and through to population scientists to have exactly this type of impact. So the four keys, I think, to achieving this success are, number one, to recruit the mo and retain the most talented faculty. And I honestly believe that nothing is more important than the faculty. If you have the right faculty, all of the rest of it will come. So we want to recruit the brightest minds across the entire spectrum from model systems to clinical trials. And here at UCLA, we've been very fortunate. I see some chairs in, in the audience. And we have found a way to work together as organized research units and chairs and deans to effectively bring people to UCLA. And it's been a, it's been a great relationship that we've had. Once we get them here, we really have a responsibility to shape an environment in which they can exceed their wildest dreams for success. And I really feel that that is our responsibility. Having achieved number one and two, you will no sooner get the outstanding faculty member here, get them established, have them exceed their wildest dreams of success, and then other institutions will launch efforts to recruit them away. <laughs> right, Jeff? So as I said, I originally prepared this talk for the Stanford Cancer Center. And so I illustrated the point that we no sooner recruit them here, get them established, than they are recruited away by showing the pictures of my former fellow, Dr. Kathy Sakamoto, Sakamoto who's division chief at Stanford, Mark Pegram, Oliver Dorigo, and of course, Sam Gambier, all of whom are now at the Stanford Cancer Center. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stanford. The second uh, objective is to invest in the mission of the organization through infrastructure and shared resources. And I used to think that infrastructure was really boring, and you know, it kind of is. But if you don't have a great infrastructure, and if you don't provide technology and shared resources to the faculty, it's going to be difficult for them to continue to compete and be successful. So the majority of the funding in our Cancer Center grant actually goes to shared resources. It really doesn't support people doing science in their laboratories. 
And the availability of such stable multi-year funding is key because we have to get the highest quality of staff that will generate a consistently high pro quality product in these shared resources. And if you can't offer that stable long-term funding, you're not going to be able to get the technical staff that you need to really keep us on the leading edge where we need to be. We have to constantly change the slide. We have to constantly evaluate the utility of having the technology on campus versus outsourcing. And the National Cancer Institute puts a lot of pressure on us to have regional shared resources rather than setting up every single shared resource on every single cancer center campus. And a good example of the uh, technology outsourcing is that some of us may remember, I do remember having an oligosynthesizer in the hood in the back of my lab, which you, know, you would no more want to do that now. The cost and the complexity of the equipment uh, requires partnerships again. Uh, the CTSI, the Clinical Translational Science Institute, dean's offices, department chairs have been great in coming together and funding these types of activities. We've learned a lot of lessons through these adventures and it's very important that we focus on academic and administrative oversight because we have to ensure the sustainability. It's, it's great to have a lot of enthusiasm about sh setting up a new shared resource, but we really have to think long term about what is the cost structure, what is the recharge structure, and how are we going to make sure that we're able to continue to offer the highest quality product to our faculty members. We try to stay engaged uh, with our users at all the times, doing user surveys frequently to see if people's needs are getting met or if there's new technologies that we've not yet established on campus. And the administrators in the Cancer Center also participate in a number of, na of national groups to help stay abreast of trends and opportunities in technology development. The leadership of a shared resource requires multiple skill sets, including obviously they have to be at the leading edge of the science, they have to have a customer service mentality, they have to be a good administrator, and they have to stay on budget. Um, it's easy for shared resources to drift over time and sort of become a shared resource for one or two labs and not really serve the, the population. And of course, that's not what we want to do. Transparency is very valuable. And a campus-wide coordinated approach to providing the funding, the equipment, the training, and the staffing is important. We have a number of ways that we're doing that on campus. The CTSI provides vouchers to faculty members to use shared resources. The Jim Economo's Vice Chancellor's Office uh, funds the Shared Resource, Shared Resource Consortium. God, it's really hard to say. The Shared Resource Consortium that uh, provides funding to get new equipment on, onto campus. And the Dean's Office is currently taking a look at the shared resources or cores that are housed within the school and looking for ways that we can improve the quality and in, in some ways upgrade the technologies that we have available. The third way is to invest in investigator-initiated research. And this is high risk, high reward by nature. We want to invest in research that the NIH would not fund because it's too risky or it's too new or it doesn't have the preliminary data that the NIH always wants to see. Um, we raise money through our Johnson Cancer Center Foundation to fund this type of research. And we think about it as venture philanthropy. We invest in you and your project. And when you're successful and you generate the desired results, you will be able to go outside UCLA to the NIH, to the DOD, to other foundations to get long-term support for your research activities. And of course, all of the administrators that are in this room and the development staff play an important role in making this happen. We have a lot of seed grant programs at UCLA, and I think they're important. They tend to be between $30,000 and $50,000. And they're especially useful, I think, if they provide some feedback to the faculty members, especially junior faculty and assistant professors. These can be the first grants that faculty members will write. And so to hear something back uh, from some more senior faculty can be very helpful. But in the Cancer Center, we decided that we could achieve a much higher impact by funding a group of faculty coming from a variety of different types of expertise to attack a cancer problem with the goal of applying long term for some sort of a P or a U grant, program project grant, multiple PIR1, those kinds of funding. So we set up the impact grant program and these grants are $200,000 per year. They can be renewed 
And when we last calculated the return on investment, we were getting something like $20 back in return for every $1 of philanthropic funding that we invested in this program. So we are in the process of reviewing. We had 18 letters of intent, and we're in the process of reviewing nine grants for this cycle. The fourth priority in the Cancer Center is to translate advances to the clinic. In other words, it's all about the patients. Um, doing clinical research and providing the infrastructure and oversight for clinical research requires an enormous amount of infrastructure that is very, very expensive. You need staff research nurses, data managers, and administrators. You need constant training at all levels. We have, as many of you in this audience know, we have evolving local, regal, regional, and national regulations that we have to comply with. We have constantly changing reporting requirements to the NIH and the National Cancer Institute. We have to be able to contract with our industry partners. Uh, we need specialized facilities for the conduct of early phase trials. And it's the single largest source of headaches for cancer center directors. However, this is what gives patients and family members hope. We have a responsibility, and I really truly believe this. If we make a great discovery and we publish it in Cell Science or Nature and we get another grant, that's terrific. But if we don't, as an institution, find a way to make that part of a body of work that's going to ultimately impact the health and well being of patients, if it has the possibility to do that, then I don't think we've discharged our obligation to society. And the only way we can make progress in treating a disease like cancer is by doing clinical trials. So we've gone through the four essential things that a cancer center can do. It can raise money. It can help provide infrastructure for clinical trials. It can provide high quality shared resources and recruit and retain the best faculty. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about our cancer center here at UCLA. The, um, we did a strategic plan in 2011 and the vision is for the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center to be an international leader conducting transdisciplinary cancer research that advances the most effective approaches to prevention, detection, and treatment while delivering the highest quality of patient-centered integrated care. We have 240 faculty members. At last count, we had about $41 million in National Cancer Institute funding and $163 million in total funding. And believe it or not, we are one of the oldest comprehensive cancer centers in the nation. Uh, we've been comprehensive for 39 years. Mercifully, I've not been director that whole 39 years. <laughs> and so as we've approached our science and as we've organized ourselves into th program areas, which are kind of mini themes within cancer, we've really focused on making progress on campus through partnerships with other outstanding units. And so the first unit that we've partnered with is, of course, we have a legendary imaging for both patients and for animal models here on campus. And so we formed a, formed a great partnership with the Crump Institute for Molecular Imaging. And we were fortunate to have an in vivo cell and molecular imaging consortium funded by the NCI over three cycles. Dr. Harvey Hirschman is the PI of that. And of course, this is in large part due to the very pioneering work of Dr. Mike Phelps in pharmacology. We also have an outstanding program in nanotechnology that has developed over the recent past. We have the California Nanosystems Institute, which is a public-private partnership located right here in the middle of campus. And we also have a Centers of Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence with Caltech. Um, Caltech, by the way, has a relationship with the Johnson Cancer Center such that their faculty members are members of our cancer center as well. So speaking of Caltech, we've had a long collaboration with Caltech through the MD-PhD program, the Joint Center for Translational Medicine, and the Engineered Immunity Consortium, which involves David Baltimore, Tony Rebus, Owen Witte, and many, many faculty looking at engineering the patient's own immune system against their tumor. I'll talk a little bit more about a model for translational therapeutics that involves the Translational Oncology Research Laboratory, local, regional, national, and international clinical trials activities. And going back to 2005, uh, we've had the Broad Stem Cell Research Center here. 
uh, led by Owen Witte. We have over $210 million in funding that has come through the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And we've recruited over 30 faculty members uh, jointly between the Cancer Center and the Stem Cell Institute. So it's really been a terrific long-term partnership. So taking into account these scientific partnerships, these are the program areas within the Cancer Center. And we start out with our most basic program area in gene regulation. And although I'm gonna be talking a lot about translation and I'm gonna be talking about new therapies and about patients, it's very important to remember that basic science is the foundation upon which all of this translational and clinical activity is built. And if we don't have strong basic science, which we of course do here at UCLA, it's really impossible to do the other kinds of work that we need to do. And it's very important that we think about how to continue supporting those basic, act basic science activities during times when the NIH budget is shrinking. And it's something that the Cancer Center and the Dean's Office, CTSA, are spending a lot of time doing right now. So we go from gene regulation to cancer nanotechnology which again is our partnership with, the, uh, with physical sciences, with engineering, chemistry and biochemistry and so on. This is our cancer and stem cell biology program area. This is our cancer molecular imaging program area. Then we move into tumor immunology, signal transduction and therapeutics, which are heavily translational with lots of clinical trial activity. And then we move into our, patient, into our population science. We're looking at patients and survivors and healthy and at risk populations in the largest and most ethnically diverse county in the United States. And this population work in turn feeds back upon this cycle. So I'm going to describe one model for a translational pipeline here at UCLA. And this was developed by Dennis Slayman, who's the clinical translational director for the Cancer Center for many, many years. And it starts out with the Translational Oncology Research Laboratory, which I'll call TORL, as well as discoveries that can be made in basic science laboratories throughout the campus. And the information that's gleaned from either this research platform that's screening small molecules for efficacy across a large panel of representative tumor types, or basic science discoveries lead to the design of early phase clinical trials, which we conduct right here at UCLA and in Santa Monica. Once the early phase clinical trials have been completed, if they look promising, we're then able to move those early phase trials out into the Translational Research in Oncology US, or TRIO US. So, Going back about to 1995, we had trained a lot of physicians in hematology, oncology, and they had gone out into practice where they were working. But they wanted to retain some kind of a connection with the university. And so the idea was, well, what if, what if we opened a limited number of clinical trials in those practices? Two things would happen. Most patients who are diagnosed with cancer don't come to a cancer center right away. Most cancer patients that are newly diagnosed are treated in the community where they reside. So, in essence, we were bringing the clinical trials that we had here at UCLA out into the communities where the patients were living and being treated. Secondly, by offering these clinical trials in a broader geographic array, we could, a geographic area, we could accrue more quickly to the clinical trial which was great for the pharmaceutical sponsor because it's very expensive every day that clinical trial is open. Later on, this translational research and oncology partnership, which was first in Southern California and then across the United States, went international by merging with an academic clinical trials organization called TRIO Global, which has uh, clinical research sites in 45 countries around the world. So this allows us to basically start with an idea, design an early phase clinical trial, take that into a national network of oncology practices, and if the data, uh, if the data are promising, to then actually conduct a registrational trial in our global network. So the this is a 
diagram of what goes on in the translational oncology research lab. We have multiple human cancer cell lines and tissue xenografts that Slayman's group has collected across a number of histologies over many years. They've been very well characterized for their proliferative cell cycle and, apot and apoptosis phenotypes. And they've also been characterized molecularly by global gene expression profiling. I, they've been divided into subsets based upon the signatures of these uh, expression profiling. And then when small molecules arrive from industry to be tested, they can compare the response to the drug with the molecular signature. <coughs> Once these data are all correlated, it becomes possible to identify predictive markers for response or resistance to novel targeted therapies. So I like to use this example because typically it's not as black and white as it is in this case, but this makes it very easy to see. This is looking at a cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitor across a panel of 40 ovarian cancer lines. And one can see here that this group of cell lines is exquisitely sensitive to the drug, and this group of cell lines is completely resistant. And so if we look at the subtypes that make up these cell lines versus those cell lines, you can see right here this gene expression profile distinguishes between the sensitive and the resistant cell lines. And what you find here is a group of genes that are involved, not surprisingly, in cell cycle regulation. And so these are the kinds of data that can be used to design early phase clinical trials. So you take ovarian cancer patients, you look for a gene signature, and then you desi design the early phase clinical trial. I don't think you can <coughs> see it, but this is the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> the, the red dots are our very own UCLA and our affiliated practices. The green dots, our, our regional network that started first in Southern California and has now spread across the country to Florida, Maryland. Uh, we actually even have a site at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Bethesda across the street from the National Cancer Institute. And this is a map of our global uh, activity, TRIO Global, which as I mentioned has practices in 45 countries around the world, and which is a nonprofit. Essentially, it constitutes our very own um, global network or cooperative group that we can offer our clinical trials to, and the academic credit for those goes with our faculty members who designed those early trials. So I've talked a lot about what cancer centers can do to have an impact. And what I'd now like to ask is, how do we measure whether we have been successful or not? Well, here's some of the numbers that I told you about. In the past five years, over 10,000 patients have participated in cancer center interventional trials. 70% of those were investigator initiated, meaning that the idea being tested came from our faculty members here at UCLA. Over 3,700 patients have participated in therapeutic clinical trials in the past five years, and 65% of them were enrolled in early phase trials, which were pilot feasibility phase one or phase two. And for people who don't think about clinical trials all the time, the fact that these are early phases is really important to us. It means we're not just putting patients on a study that was somebody else's idea that's potentially an incremental improvement over what we've been doing the last 30 years. That's never been what our goal is here at UCLA. Our goal is to be trying to push the envelope to find the next thing, to make something that's a really significant and important improvement in the way cancer patients are treated. So now I'm going to tell you a few little vignettes um, about how we measure success here at UCLA. This is Dennis Slayman, as you know, and Herceptin was FDA approved in 1998 to treat one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer. Subsequent trials have led to its use in a variety of settings for patients whose tumors overexpress the target, which is the HER2 gene. Over 420,000 women have been treated with Herceptin. And interestingly, HER2 positive breast cancer has gone from the breast cancer with the worst outcome to in many cases now the breast cancer 
that has the best outcome because of Herceptin and other similar uh, molecules. This is Owen Witte and Charles Sawyers. And here on the cover of Time magazine uh, is Gleevec. And Gleevec was FDA approved in 2001 for the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. And this builds upon the basic research of Owen and the early phase clinical trials that were conducted by Charles. And one of the most remarkable things back in 2001 is that I never thought that in my career there would be a pill for cancer, especially a pill for something like leukemia. And in fact, this is an oral drug. Patients carry around in a little bottle and they take it as a pill. Now some of the patients that took Gleevec had their chronic myeloid leukemia come back. It became resistant to the Gleevec. And so Owen and Charles and Neil Shaw collected the cells from those patients who became resistant to Gleevec, and they studied them at the molecular level to figure out what had gone wrong. And they found that the conformation of the target protein had changed slightly, so the drug didn't fit in the pocket anymore. And they began to work on clinical trials of a second drug for chronic myeloid leukemia. And that drug is Sprycell, and it was FDA approved only five years after the initial approval of Gleevec, which in terms of drug development is lightning speed. Well, here's Charles again, and here's Mike Jung, who's right there. Yay, Mike. <laughs> Charles and Michael were working to develop an important, potent anti-androgen for castration-resistant prostate cancer. And that drug was FDA approved in 2012. It's called Extandi. And the annual market for this drug is estimated at $3 billion. And um, this is a, a very important advance in this type of aggressive prostate cancer. Here we have Tony Rebus and Mark Davis of Caltech. And this is a clinical trial in which the first RNAi molecules were systemically administered via targeted nanoparticles, which are these little spaceships here that deliver the, the uh, RNA molecules. And this was published in Nature in 2010. And what they were able to show is that the nanoparticles actually did deliver their payload to the tumor cells, and you could actually visualize the siRNA inside the tumor cells. So this was a very exciting advance that takes advantage of some of the technology that's developing here and at Caltech in terms of nanotechnology. Well, here's Tony again. And in the year 2013, we had two experimental drugs that received breakthrough therapy status from the FDA. This is a new type of program to try to fast track promising drugs through FDA approval. And so one of them, which was at the time known as MK3475, developed by Merck, was designated breakthrough therapy in 2013 <coughs> for metastatic <coughs> melanoma. And I'm happy to report that this drug was very successful in clinical trials with about 75% of patients with metastatic melanoma achieving a response. And it has a new name, Keytruda, and it was just approved on uh, September 4th of this year. You may have seen some of the publicity. And this is really a landmark achievement for Tony and his colleagues in the tumor immunology program area. They have been struggling for years to find a way to harness the patient's own immune system against, its, against their tumor. And the thought had always been, if we could harness the patient's immune system, it would be much more powerful than anything else we were ever going to devise, because the immune system has such powerful ways to detect and to destroy uh, invading substances. And so it turns out that the tumor itself secretes molecules that sort of turn off the immune system. It sort of render the tumor invisible to the immune system. And what this drug does is it foils the ability of the tumor to shut down the immune system and actually allows the patient's immune system to recognize and destroy the tumor. And studies are ongoing. This was approved in melanoma, but studies are ongoing in lung cancer and other types of solid tumor, and we're really hoping that the same kinds of powerful effects will be found in some of these other solid tumors for which 
once the disease becomes metastatic, it's been very, very difficult to achieve lasting responses in patients. Here we have Dennis Lehman again, and here's Richard Finn. I mentioned that we had two drugs in 2013 out of the total of maybe, I don't know, 25 or 30 that received breakthrough therapy status. This was the other one. This is a Pfizer CDK4-6 inhibitor. And it was tested in early phase trials in women who had metastatic estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And based upon the preliminary results, this was, a, this was granted breakthrough, stat, breakthrough therapy status in 2013. And this is a plot that shows how long people are surviving without their disease progressing. And in the yellow line, you can see that under the standard therapy, these women have disease that is progressing rapidly. And this is the new drug, the CDK4-6 inhibitor, and you can see that the patients relapse at much slower times. And if you look at 50%, what they found was that the time of relapse more than doubled in the patients who were receiving this new therapy. Now, that may not seem that significant to you, but it's a remarkable increase. We're used to seeing, the clinicians are used to seeing impacts of a few percent when they take traditional chemotherapies and marry them up in different ways. And so to double the progression-free survival in this population of women is very exciting, and I think it's just the beginning of how this drug will go on to improve uh, survival in this population of patients. And we're hopeful that the studies that are ongoing right now will hold up and confirm this data and that this drug will go on to FDA approval within the next few months as well. So in summary, the Cancer Center is founded on the highest quality of basic clinical and population-based research. We have a 20-year successful history of translating our work to identify targets to work with our partners in academia or industry to obtain inhibitors, design and conduct clinical trials in, pop in targeted populations. And while we value high-profile publications and grant funding and counting things, we really measure our true success by whether our work is having an impact on prevention, detection, treatment, and the quality of life of cancer survivors. And I'd like to finish by telling you two things. This is that same article by Joe Simone that he wrote about understanding cancer centers that started out with a rather bleak statement about being a cancer center director. At the end of the article, what Joe says is that a cancer center directorship can be one of the more rewarding jobs in academic medicine. Academic cancer centers at their best are remarkable engines of discovery and high quality medical care and they often play a central role in the vitality of an academic medical center. And I think that has definitely been the case at UCLA. We have an amazing faculty and staff, and it's really been a time of incredible progress in the area of cancer research. When I became director in 1995, and Mike Titel can, can uh, verify this, cancers were all diagnosed by pathologists that were looking in a microscope, and they were looking at certain features, Sophia Apple as well. They were looking at certain features of the cancer and they would give it a name and it, the name would be based upon the organ in which it arose and then the, it would get given a stage and a grade and it would be a sort of an estimate of how aggressive and how far along the tumor was. And then every single person who had that would get treated the same. And some people would do really well and other people wouldn't and nobody knew why and it was a very different time in terms of the types of treatments that we could offer. Now, technology has played a huge role in terms of the genome project and in terms of understanding signaling pathways, understanding systems biology, in allowing us to define patients' tumors in a more personalized and a more individualized way and to develop some of the types of targeted therapies that I just described to you, which have many fewer side effects and in, in proper administration and proper cases, they can actually have very long-term effects and even, in fact, be life-saving. And so I'm going to finish up by talking about our JCCF donor recognition dinner, which we had a couple weeks ago on September 16th. A lot of the work that I've talked about today was made possible by the philanthropic contributions of our supporters, our guilds, our board members, people in the community that have had an experience with cancer 
who want to participate in a positive way in making a difference. And so every year in September, we have a really nice dinner, and we invite the people that have supported us to come to that dinner and um, become part of our family. And we started a tradition about 15 years ago where we would feature <laughs> one of our doctors and one of the patients that had participated in a clinical trial that they were running. And this was a really tangible example that our donors could understand. Here's a patient, and they have a type of cancer, and we don't have a good treatment for it, but what we can offer them is to participate in a clinical trial. And it may not help them, but we're really hoping that it will help someone else in the future. And the patients that participate in these clinical trials are truly heroes. There's no question about it. So we invited a patient and a doctor. And then the next year, we invited the first patient, and then we invited a second patient and another doctor. And then each year, we invited all of the patients we had invited in past years along with the new patient. And some of the people don't live in California anymore, and it's not convenient for them to come. But a number of them come every year. And every year, we get to sort of celebrate their personal story and the success of their treatment. So I was just going to briefly tell you about three patient survivors among all of those who came to the dinner two weeks ago at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And the first one is Virginia Empey. And Virginia Empey had breast cancer. And in 1995, she was very, very ill. And she literally came to campus and went to Dennis Lehman's office and knocked on the door and said, I heard you have a clinical trial, and I really would like to participate. And so it turned out that she qualified for the trial, and she volunteered, and she participated. And I'm happy to say that it's almost 20 years since that time. She lives in Bakersfield, and she drives <laughs> down every year to come to the donor dinner. And it's really terrific and wonderful to see her. And of course, she has a completely full and, and wonderful life. Last year, Tony Rebus and Tom Stutz came to the Cancer Center dinner. And this is when Tony was doing his clinical trial that I told you about with the, uh, with the molecule that allows the patient's immune system to recognize the tumor. And poor Tom Stutz, he was very, very sick. And he was taking care of his wife, and his wife had Lou Gehrig's disease, and she passed away. And he went to the hospital because he wasn't feeling well. And it turned out he had widely disseminated metastatic melanoma. And he was... He was really very ill. He was in a wheelchair. He went into the hospital. He started saying goodbye to his family and his friends and really thought, you know, that this was the end. And then he happened to have the good fortune of landing Tony Rebus as his doctor. And Tony says, well, you know, I have this clinical trial. It might help. And sure enough, he went on to the clinical trial and with the PD-1 inhibitor. And his lesions started melting away. And he very quickly gained his strength back. And by the time he spoke at our donor dinner last year, he was playing two hours of tennis every day. So <laughs> it was really great. And he came again this year, too, because now he was celebrating that the drug was FDA approved. In the last vignette, this is, this is Bob Ferber. And if any of you have ever heard Bob Ferber speak, you wouldn't forget about it. So Bob, uh, in 1999, Bob had terrible chronic myeloid leukemia. And he worked in the city attorney's office, and he prosecuted people who abuse animals. And he had a menagerie of animals at home that included three-legged dogs and blind cats and all sorts of animals that nobody wanted. And he loved his animals, and his, he just was all about his animals and his work. And, but he was, really, he was really losing his battle. He signed up to have a bone marrow transplant. And then they said, well, you know, we're going to do a bone marrow transplant, and then you're going to have to get rid of all your animals because when you come home, you won't have a, a sufficient immune system, and, you know, you have to get rid of all these animals. And so he just couldn't do it. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. And he had heard that there was a clinical trial at UCLA of a new drug and that he had tried to get into the trial and was told that there was no space. And he was driving on the 405 one day, and his phone rings, and it's Charles Sawyers. And Charles is calling to say, there's been an opening in the trial. And if you can get here before 5 o'clock, we can put you in this slot. 
<coughs> and Bob says, I'm on the 405. I can't get there by 5 o'clock. And Charles says, well, do the best you can. So he manages to come careening into the, into the parking lot of the 200 building. And the way he tells the story, Charles was sitting there on a folding chair with a clipboard with the consent form all ready for him to sign. And in fact, Bob was the last patient enrolled on the phase one trial for Gleevec. And he had an immediate, almost an immediate response and returned to full health. And when he came to the donor dinner two weeks ago, he actually bought, brought his bottle of Gleevec pills and took it up to the podium where you see him here as he was telling his story and thanking all of the people who've supported the work at the Cancer Center. So in conclusion, I would say that's why cancer centers matter. Thank you very much. I'm just telling the story, man. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes? I was very glad to see this. In addition to prevention and treatment, you were emphasizing survivorship, which is the newest in this area. Survivorship. Mm -hmm. survivorship. What, are, what are the successes in that state? I'm so glad you asked. So the question is, what about survivorship? I focused, as I said I was going to do, on drugs and therapies and patients because that's an easy story to understand. But Patty Gans's whole career here at UCLA for the past two decades has been on survi studying survivorship. And she started out with breast cancer patients and has expanded and has actually written the guidelines adopted by the Institute of Medicine for how to transition pa patients out of successful treatment into survivorship. And she's also studied a lot of the late effects of cancer. And what used to be the case is the doctor would say, OK, your cancer's gone, you're cured, go back and enjoy your life. But people experienced all sorts of things, from cognitive problems to fatigue to secondary cancers as a result of the treatment. And so Patty and her colleagues in the Prevention and Control Division have done a remarkable job of figuring out what these long-term effects are. And Jackie Casillas, I need to mention, who does this with uh, adolescents and young adults as well, which has a whole additional series of problems around fertility and, and those types of things. And so one of the things that they're studying now is with Mike Irwin in the Norman Cousins Neuropsychiatric Immunolo Neuropsychoimmunology uh, Center is what is the biological basis underneath fatigue, for example. And it looks like a lot of it has to do with cytokine production and chronic inflammation and, and types of things like that, that maybe we could actually treat those or prevent them or control them in this population and they wouldn't need to have this, this needless uh, suffering. So there's over 12 million survivors in the country right now and we're fully expecting that number to grow. And um, Patty deserves a tremendous amount of credit for, and she's won many, many, many national and international awards for her work uh, when she was kind of a lone voice out there 20 years ago when she started this. And as I said, she basically wrote the report that was adopted by the Institute. She chaired the committee that wrote the report that was adopted by the Institute of Medicine. So, yeah. So it's such a positive story, and I don't want to be a downer. Well, then don't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know in your mind, what are the big challenges now for continuing this big um, you know, success story? What are, are, are there certain any challenges that are? We have huge challenges. Um, we have population challenges that have to do with the obesity rates and uh, lifestyle, um, tobacco. You know, we haven't really gotten a handle on those. So we want to turn cancer into a chronic disease. We want people who have cancer now to receive treatment and to live out their life and not succumb to their disease. But what we really need to do is we need to prevent cancer. And that's a real black box. And so what we're hoping, Kelsey, is that as we start to get more and more genomic and other types of omic information about patients and we put that together with large population studies and in the CTSI we're going to have 20 million patient records that we can look at, we have to start predicting early who's going to be at risk for cancer and we have to start coming up with interventions to try to prevent it because that's really, you know, what would have the most impact is if we're able to, to start to prevent it. Now certainly cutting down on tobacco use has a huge impact 
There's no question about that. So, and we have to get a handle on the obesity epidemic, figure out what things in our environment are causing cancer and, and those types of things. On the treatment side, we're going to have to start using these targeted therapies in combination. And that's obvious if you think about antibiotics or, you know, <laughs> other targeted things. The cells are clever. They develop resistance. And so trying to figure out what the combinations of targeted therapy are that will hopefully result in success is very important. Um, another challenge that we baby boomers are going to face is that we have a huge shortage of oncology doctors and nurses. And so providing the care for the people. Cancer is a disease of aging. If you think about it, you're exposed to whatever you're exposed to, be it sunlight or food or toxins in your environment. And the longer you live, the more chance you have for these mutations to accumulate. Your immune system sort of gets not so great and suddenly you're starting to experience these symptoms. So we have at the same time, the baby boomers are aging and we're going to have a, a huge shortage in doctors and nurses in oncology. But I think there's a lot of basic science that needs to be done and is being done now. And, and I just, I don't think you can, I don't think you can overemphasize the importance of the basic science foundation for all of the progress that we've seen in treating patients and in terms of, of uh, cancer survivors. Did I see it correctly that uh, Finland, uh, Norway, and India were not part of the... Well, I don't know. Let's go back and see. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure um, if they... I have a list somewhere, but... There it, two it, colors. Yeah, there, there were... And then the little names were over there on the side. Yeah. Yeah. The gray was not. Yeah. I was surprised. Norway, Finland, India, some of these were not. But so, so different uh, groups kind of come and go at different times. This was a pre-existing <laughs> clinical research organization, non-for-profit, that was doing breast cancer trials. And we, they are based in, in Canada. They started out in Canada, and their, their administrative structure is in Canada. And so we went to them to try to do some clinical trials together and form sort of a long-term partnership. And so it's been great for them because they get high quality trials. It's great for us because we can rapidly enroll these trials and get large numbers. The other thing that's interesting that's changed so much is that, so in the early days, there were some famous trials in uh, lung cancer where all patients with lung cancer were enrolled and there was no benefit seen for the drugs. And that's because, again, we couldn't segment the population into people had the certain mutation that the targeted therapy was against. So now we can do smaller, more targeted trials in fewer patients that have at least the biomarkers that we think will make them a good candidate for a treatment success. Yes? I know some centers like um, Cedar sinai they're working for gene banks, gene banking for the personalized medicine. Do we have this facility here or are we working for that? Yeah, we just had a, I wasn't able to go, but we just had a UCLA Genomics Summit last week and brought together the research group, the researchers and the clinical folks that are, uh, what right now we're doing whole exome sequencing and over a thousand pediatric patients who have inherited disorder that hasn't been able to be diagnosed. And that's uh, Wayne Grody and Stan Nelson and their colleagues that are doing that. So we're expanding the whole exome sequencing, moving into whole genome sequencing. And the goal there is to obtain the sequence, give the oncologist any markers that have been shown to be targetable, and then as, as more mutations become targetable, then we already have that information stored in the database. So I think all of cancer medicine is moving in that direction. It's really just a matter of setting up the proper infrastructure and making sure that the data are behind firewalls and all those types of things. Okay. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you for everything that you did.